Um, otherwise, next in the program, uh, Olo Rogeberg will present a talk with the title Too Late But Still Great, identifying the lives saved by opioid-assisted therapy, or LA, in Norway. Uh, Olo Rogeberg is a senior research fellow and deputy director at the Frisch Center for Economic Research in Oslo. His work includes research into the regulation of drugs and economic theories of addiction. He is an active participant in the Norwegian drug policy debates. Please welcome Olo Rogeberg. Thank you. Um, one little detail, I'm not a deputy director anymore, but I, I, I have been, so just to be fair. So I'm going to be talking about uh, opioid substitution therapy in Norway, and I'm going to be, uh, be placing it inside a historical context. I'm going to be, it's a story in three chapters. I'm going to talk briefly about the ideology behind Norway's drug policy, which is, you know, the, the sort of canvas that, that, that has been behind us all day today. I'm going to be talking about Norway and opioid substitution therapy, the history of how that came about. And then I'm going to be talking about a paper that I had in addiction together with some colleagues a couple of years ago uh, on the causal effects that this program had when it was introduced in 1997 and, and whether it actually did help uh, reduce the overdose deaths in Norway. So I'm going to start with uh, the ideology behind Norway's drug policy, where a sort of chapter heading could be prevention is almost everything. So this is something that takes us back to the uh, late 1960s, where uh, when young people started growing their hair long, uh, wearing weird clothes, singing music in the park, and smoking weed using LSD. Uh, and there was a moral panic. Uh, this was seen as a... Uh, dissolution of society's norms. There was a lot of uh, newspaper reports on how this was an epidemic that could spread and, and destroy a whole generation. Uh, and in Norway, we had this man called Karl Evang. He was a very impressive man. Uh, and I mean that with no irony at all. He was the director general of health in Norway uh, from 1938 to 1972. He was involved in a lot of different public health oriented uh, things such as you know, <coughs> improving sexual education in the population. Uh, he, he, yeah, so he, he, he did a lot of good stuff. He was also involved in the uh, creation of uh, the World Health Organization. And in the late 1960s, when this became a problem, he wrote a book um, which was called Actuelle Narcotica Problemer, Current Drug I Problems. Um, a few years later, he came with a revised and updated version we talked about drugs, the generations, and society. And he used these books to sort of develop this sort of extensive sort of framework for how to think about the drug problem in society and what the right way to address it would be. And he thought this was a really severe problem. In one of his books, he writes that, as for the comparison with tobacco and alcohol, it should suffice to note that if marijuana and hashish were as widespread in our society as tobacco and alcohol are today, all organized form of social life and activity would likely cease. <laughs> and yeah, it's easy to laugh at today, but at the time, this was seen as a, as a very big problem. And uh, let's see here. Yeah, he established there was this uh, lead, uh, the council for the Central Council for Drug Issues, which was this coordinating high-level uh, group that was supposed to coordinate efforts across the different uh, departments and ministries uh, and to coordinate the effort. He was the leader of that that started in 1969. And he had this public health-oriented approach throughout. So uh, he wrote in one of his books that epidemiological thinking is useful when it comes to emphasizing that if we are to hope to combat drug abuse, we must primarily focus on preventive measures. And the reason he felt that was that the options that they had for treatment were quite limited. They didn't have much evidence that they were very efficacious, that they were very effective. And so if you have a problem that you think is extremely severe and very, very dangerous, you want to just prevent that from ever happening. And he largely wrote the first government white paper in 1975 uh, about the drug problem, uh, which sort of set up the framework for how Norwegian policy on the, in the drug field would be for the next 50 years. 
and it has a very sort of broadly conceived framework for what prevention means. So we have drug-related harms, that's what we want to address, but the way he's, the, 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 since we have limited treatment options, we should, he was very clear that we should try and treat the people who have problems, and we should try to integrate them in society, give them employment, housing, education, try to help them and integrate them back into society, but he felt that it was a very, very challenging task, and so it was better to address it through prevention and by reducing the use prevalence. And there are three ways to do that. The first one, the first factor that he thought was maybe the most important one was the societal context. He thought that we had a society where people had been uprooted from traditional communities, they were alienated, they were in the cities, they were lacking purpose, they were, they, 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 they were not connected, and this, was, this created this sort of alienation, created this vulnerability in the population. Second, you needed availability. If people are vulnerable to using drugs, but there are no drugs available, they're not going to use drugs. So that was a second pillar that was very important to address. So the societal context was really about all kinds of other, like, general political issues, right? It's about the, econ uh, the econom economy overall, about uh, how people are, the urbanization. It's about these big topics that are, like, outside of drug policy. But the availability was very, very much central to his approach to drugs specifically. And finally, norms and beliefs in the population. What attitudes do people have? What do they know about these drugs? How do they view people who use drugs? And how do they view the use of drugs? And this gave a public health justification for a war on drugs in Norway. It was there were two main pillars in this government white paper. The two most important pillars that they highlight, the first is to keep drug use unacceptable, to have a pure zero-tolerance approach. Uh, they write that any form of social acceptance of addictive substances must be opposed, both among the general public as a whole and in smaller groups and subcultures. It is of the utmost importance to avoid, avoid the formation, especially in larger cities, of more or less permanent environments where drug users can stay and live their lives over extended periods. So the thing that he wanted, he wanted the police to go in there and find these groups, and, and, and then he wanted there to be a social support system that was right there alongside, that took the people and said, you get education, you can get housing for you, we're going to find meaningful activities for you. That was how he describes it. He didn't want to have prison. He said, prison sentences, the criminologists tell us that's not really effective, but we need to have this prohibition because we need to send a clear signal and we need to have a, a means of to go in and break up these things. Second, he wanted to minimize the illegal markets. Restrictive measures to make dangerous substances as hard to access as possible are another main pillar in the fight against abuse. So the main focus here is on non-users, preventing them from going into use. The most important preventive measures are to reduce availability and promote protective attitudes in the population. This was in the uh, one of the biggest Norwegian encyclopedias written by uh, another very famous uh, person in the drug policy field in Norway, Helge Wall, who we'll, be, who we'll get back to later. Uh, and this was written after the year 2000. So we're talking about this, this is like f 30, 40 years later, this is still prevalent, this is still the focus. This is the way that it's been and it's the way we're still thinking about drugs in Norway. And this rhetoric the way I see it, this seems to have become a very, very useful rhetoric for the police and prohibitionists. In other countries, you'll see that there's like a public health approach that is focused on treatment and helping, and a punitive war on drugs effort that we're going to criminalize people and get the bad guys. But here, we, we, we sort of put it inside a very sort of nice and solidaric sort of framing, and we said that the reason we're using the punitive measures, the reason we're doing the drug war, is to help. Helping is punishing in the setting. So his rhetoric made it easy and natural and palatable to Norwegians, I believe, to intensify the Norwegian drug war. When the drug use continued using, it was like, this is the medicine that we've agreed is appropriate, it's not working, and the police were able to say, look, we can do more. Let us do more. And the emphasis gradually evolved away from his sort of humanitarian sort of framing of this into a more hardline punitive policy. Let's see, here we go, yeah. And to my, m the way I see it, this zero tolerance approach arguably also promoted a sort of dehumanization over time. Because we wanted to say that drug use was so horrible that you really needed to stay away from it, and you got this idea that a life where drug use was involved was not a truly human life. 
that allowing people to continue using drugs was to give up on them as human beings and to sort of just resign yourself to them sort of having been lost. And that gets us to this substitution therapy in Norway. And the, the history there, I would say, is zero tolerance and the greater good. Here is the Norwegian overdose deaths year by year up to 2001. And as you can see, it was reasonably low during the 80s, and then it started to escalate quite rapidly during the 90s, and it kept on increasing. Now, opioid substitution therapy, with the use of methadone, had been used. I mean, you have uh, there were individual doctors in the UK that had been giving heroin to addicts back throughout the 50s and 40s. Uh, but methadone treatment in the clinic was something that is associated with the period of Nixon, actually, where they, that was actually promoted in several places in the U.S., and they uh, were quite, they got good results from that. So it was known even back in the 70s. And there were very small-scale attempts to use methadone even then. Helge Wall, that I mentioned earlier, he was at that time a, a quite freshly educated doctor. He worked under a guy called Anfin Teigen. They had a small-scale experiment with methadone. There was another person called Jarl Jørsta. He had about five or six people on methadone. They just dropped that after a while. They didn't feel that the results were good enough or, 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 or convincing enough. There were some doctors, general physicians, that just did this privately, that gave people uh, scripts. But this was discouraged actively in 1974, and in 1976, they were no longer allowed to do so. Moving to 1986, we had the HIV period, uh, and the question became, could we take the people who are injecting users and who are infected with HIV and put them on methadone to stop the spread of disease? I've seen some people say that that was arguably also something people did to protect the normal population, since a lot of the drug users, the female drug users, worked as prostitutes, and they were concerned that a spread of HIV within this population could transmit to the general population. But irrespective of, of, of what the reasoning was, they, this was a debate in the middle of the 1980s, and uh, at that time, they had tried to have like a consensus uh, committee to look into this. Helge Wall also suggested that they have a methadone program for about 50 to 100 long-term users, which he framed as a sort of palliative care thing for people who had progressed to the stage where we didn't really have any treatment options available. We tried everything, and it was just to ease their continued existence. This was not accepted, but in 1989, uh, methadone was given to six HIV-infected patients. And this evolved into a, a quite unique, in, in a world setting, uh, treatment track, where you actually had to have HIV to be allowed to get methadone for your opioid addiction, which was weird, but it, it, it was some, something that happened. In 1992, we had a new director of health, who was called Tudbjörn Mörk. He came with uh, cautious signals. Uh, he had a big debate in the newspaper with uh, one of the police chiefs, who strongly opposed this. In 1994, they started with a methadone project that was aiming for 50 patients. It was started in Oslo. And methadone was here seen as a temporary thing. It was something that was going to help you stabilize yourself. And then once you were stabilized, you would then be able to sort of go into more uh, you know, abstention-oriented treatment after a while. But that was the goal. So this was a stopgap on the way to abstention. And finally, I mean, the, the, the drug problem just continued increasing, and, and when we get to 1997, the parliament said, we, we, we're going to do this. We're going to put opioid substitution therapy into the regular health system. It's going to be something that is going to have roughly seven to 800 patients. That was the estimate. Uh, because we don't really know, or we didn't know at this time, and we still don't really know how many people do we have that are injecting and using opioids. Uh, the numbers, I mean, this is something that if you don't get caught by the police or if you don't go and ask for treatment, you, you are not absurd. We have no way of seeing you. And uh, the num people were very uncertain how many patients there really were here that would be relevant. And, and also this was thought of as something that was going to be given to a very restricted group. People who were more than 30 years old, who had tried and exhausted all other treatment alternatives, 
and uh, uh, who would be on this for a limited time so they could get their life in order and then try to become drug-free. What happened in practice was that they saw that the people who exited treatment got a much higher risk of overdoses again, and so they changed the program to be more focused on uh, uh, retention and keeping them in treatment to keep the risks low. But the point here is that public health, throughout this period, the public health framework that Evang had come up with back in the 60s, became an argument against the medical treatment. Because giving people methadone was seen as accepting and condoning continued drug use, and it broke with the zero-tolerance approach. This is something that Helge Wohl, uh, who, as we remember, actually wanted to have more methadone treatment, he summarized this in 1990 by saying that when we have chosen a negative stance towards the methadone program in Norway, this is after an overall assessment. Even though good programs can be beneficial for some, the signals are mixed. We abandon the general goal of substance-free living. So this goal of, of like not condoning or accepting continued use, because that would be giving up on people, that became something that was so important because it was such a big part of the preventive message that we couldn't accept methadone. Chief of the Drug Division in the Oslo Police said that a yes to methadone treatment is a yes to the liberalization of Norwegian drug policy. Methadone is addictive. Heroin is merely replaced with a legal substance. And the police in this period also made claims that it was not going to reduce overdose risks. If anything, it was going to increase them because now people would get their methadone dose and they would top up with uh, elsewhere. Uh, people would be less afraid of becoming drug users because they would know that if everything went wrong, they could get on the methadone program. So there were lots of weird messaging around this, and they were quite certain that this was wrong. It was seen as giving up on people. Here's a, a department, a famous department person in, in Norway, an uh, influential person, who said that the desire to help clients with major problems must not prevent us from having overarching stances. We cannot let the needs of the few determine the treatment strategies we rely on. It's about two different views of humanity, one that involves faith in change and one that entails resignation. And finally, if you really want to take this all the way, he also said things that made it seem that overdose deaths were an acceptable price to pay for prevention. We probably also have to learn, he said, to see that some problems cannot be fully resolved. Perhaps we even have to accept that some will perish so that others can get help. And that brings us to the uh, causal effects of the Norwegian opioid substitution therapy on population overdose deaths. Because when this was introduced in 1997, it was not promoted by the field of substance use professionals in Norway. They were largely skeptical. This was driven by politicians. They were the ones who felt that they had to do something because of the escalating and increasing uh, overdose problem. And I'll call this flattening the curve, a phrase we're familiar with from the COVID pandemic. Uh, and in this case, I think you'll see soon why that is an appropriate thing, because initially, if you read the Norwegian reports that came after this opioid substitution therapy program had been in place, it was seen as, very, as, a, as a big paradox because the drug deaths did not decrease. Here are the patients enrolled. Each line is from a different region in Norway, and then you have the total line here at the top that shows the, that, that you know, within a couple of years, we've already passed the 1,000 patients mark. And remember, the program was initially thought to going to scale up to about seven to 800 users. By 2010, we were reaching 7,000 users. Uh, so this program escalated a lot more rapidly than anyone had thought. But the overdose deaths did not really decline. They stayed stable. And there was a report from the Norwegian, well, Cetus, uh, so it was the Norwegian Drug and Alcohol uh, Research Institute, uh, which was later in moved into the Public Health Norway. They wrote a report on drug-induced deaths in Norway where they wrote that the decline from 2001 was probably linked to the fact that the number of patients in medication-assisted rehabilitation began to increase from the turn of the millennium. But a continued increase in the number of patients after 2003 has not, to the same extent, contributed to a further reduction in the number of drug-induced deaths. There is no 
player explanation for this. So in other words, the assumption here is that this here, this, this, this decline from here to here is due to this increase in patients that we see here, but that this continued increase here had no causal effect because the overdose deaths were largely stable. But when we talk about stable, we have to see it in a, in a broader context. And if you look at it in the broader context, saying that this is stable is misleading because this comes as a continuation of a very rapid escalation that has been occurring over time. So when we're, that when we're, when we're looking at a thing like this, like overdose deaths over time, we have to think about how would these overdose deaths have changed over time if we had not had this program and to what extent has this been changed by the fact that we have this program? And we don't know the number of users, as I mentioned, and we don't really know the per user risk. We don't know your overdose risk as an average user, given some age and sex and educational background, family background, whatever. So we, we, we don't know, and we don't know the counterfactual here. We don't know what would have occurred in the absence of this large system that we got. What we do know is that over time, there has been an increasing number of birth cohorts that have been exposed to heroin in their youth. The people who were born, who grew up in the 50s, there was no heroin market. They were not going to start using heroin, and we don't see people from their generation using heroin to any extent. Heroin comes in the 1970s, and it's the people growing up then and later that you see have a prevalence of overdoses uh, as they age. And over time, there have been more and more of these birth cohorts that have come in with heroin experience. So there's an increasing number of birth cohorts that are active heroin users. And the ones that never were exposed, they are getting older and older and starting to die off. So the increase that we're seeing is, is, is this transitional period that we are in from a society where there was no heroin market to a society where there has been one. And we also know how many people are dying from a drug overdoses in each birth cohort, and we know how many people are being treated uh, in each birth cohort. And what we try to do is to then use a model-based approach. And now I'm going to be a little technical, so if you fall off, don't worry. Uh, it's for those who are specially interested. But I'm going to be talking about what we did in this paper uh, that I did together with Daniel Bergsvik from Public Health Norway and Thomas Klavsen from Serov. And we developed a model. And, and what you see here is, is, is you, it just four fictitious, we just made them up just to illustrate the point, four fictitious birth cohorts. The first ones, they are born in a period where there is uh, opioid substitution therapy available. So when they're 20, some people start entering treatment. They enter treatment, and at some point, there are, you know, there are no more people from that birth cohort who want to enter treatment. There's another birth cohort here. There was no opioid substitution available before they turned 40, but at that point, there was a lot of pent-up demand, so it increases rapidly. And there's a high prevalence cohort, so there's a lot of potential patients. So you have these different profiles that we added in here. And then our assumption is that, you know, that there's all these regularities. People start using drugs at specific times of their life. They transition between different types of drug use. Some people exit with treatment, some people exit without treatment. The, their bodies change as they age and have been exposed to stress, etc. And this gives us a, a sort of age profile of overdose risk. And, and that has a certain profile that we estimate from the data. But the point is that if we assume that this age profile is reasonably similar for people born in one year and people born in another year. But when people are treated, if treatment actually reduces your risk, we would see this curve would not be visible because the people who get treated already at the age of 20, as they enter treatment, the, that birth cohort's curve will, will not reach the heights from before because some of them have been treated and have reduced their risk. The people who enter treatment at 40, they only start reducing the risk in this curve from the age of 40. But the different, like, by looking at when different birth cohorts enter treatment and using the variation in when people could access treatment and the ease with which they could get treatment slots, we, can try to, we, we would expect that to, be, to show up in, in these overdose trends. And if the effects are moderate, as they are here, it would look like this. But if the effects are really big from treatment, yeah, let's see, go here first, we would see much bigger shifts. So 
the size of the shifts that happen tell us how much the treatment reduced the overdose risks. That's the idea we use. And of course, there are, so that's the key assumption is that the birth cohorts would have had a similar sort of age profile. Now, prevalence can differ. So some places there might be a lot of users, so then you would have this profile lifted up. Some pr uh, birth cohorts could have few users, it would move down, but the profile of it, we assume, would be the same. And then in addition, we also assume that there can be market shocks that can influence risks for all ages. So in the real data, this, this is real data. These two here are still just model estimates just to show you, to illustrate. But these are the real birth cohorts that we have in the data. With the youngest ones that we can only observe up to about 20, 25, they we see that they have access to uh, opioid substitution therapy from a young age. But there are people up here who could not access it until they got into their mid-40s or 50s. So this is the variation that we observe in treatment entries. And if you then use the same sort of stylized age profile that we started with, if there are medium effects, we would expect to see these birth cohorts be on these different trajectories here. If there are strong effects, we would expect the trajectories to be more different. So what we're doing is we're using the data both to estimate the age profile and to sort of see how big is this shift that the treatment has sort of caused on these curves. So the results, I mean, it's, you get imprecise results, but it's consistent with what other studies have sort of used. And other studies have typically, so randomized clinical trials, overdoses are too rare to really be statistically significantly reduced. So we see that there's a reduction, but there's not enough of those events that we can say that they've been reduced um, to a statistically significant extent. So typically what we're doing is we're looking at people who are on waiting lists, or people who have exited treatment, and we're comparing their rates of overdoses to those who are in treatment. That has its own methodological issues, which we don't have, and then we have some methodological issues that they don't have, but at least the estimates seem roughly consistent. And the treatment effect we find is that if you enter 100 people into opioid substitution therapy, you get about one less death in the population from overdoses. And, the, and this means that the um, reduction relative to what it would have been without the LAR program has been increasing over time as an increasing number of people have gone into treatment. And in the last year of the data that we had access to, 2016, uh, the numbers we estimate were about 30% below what they would have otherwise been. So there was a reduction in overdose deaths in 2016 of about 30% is our estimate. Across this whole period that we were looking at, 1997 was when it was introduced up to 2016. And the, the, the average, here you can see there's a big uncertainty. This is the 50% credibility intervals. This is where the model says you can be 50% certain that the effect is inside here. And these are like different sort of uh, variants that the referees and the statistical editor wanted, but you can see it doesn't really influence it. We're about 1,000 lives saved across this period as a whole. And then we did a robustness test where we ran the same model on overdose deaths that are related to non-opioids, amphetamines and other drugs. And there the model says that there's no evidence at all that the opioid substitution program had an effect on those overdoses, which is sort of good because it helps us feel that, that, that this is picking up some real effect of the treatment on opioid overdoses. And that's really the conclusion, that if we superimpose, so this is our estimated, this is how we estimate that the overdose trends would have evolved if we had never had the opioid substitution program. And as far as we can tell, they would likely have continued to use, and so the curve has been flattened by this program. And then I'd like to also just briefly, in the last minute that I have, talk a little bit about this curve here, this big peak. So in the way we typically try to estimate how many people are using heroin in Norway is using something called the mortality multiplier. So you assume that a person who uses opioids actively has maybe a 1% chance of dying, and then if you see 100 people dying, you multiply that by 100 and you get 10,000 users. And so this big bump here, in past Norwegian research literature, this has been interpreted as an immense increase in the number of heroin users 
over a very short time that was dramatically cut. And we don't think that's possible. Um, and we try to find, like, what our model says is that this increase here is different because this increase happens across all ages. All ages see an increased risk in around these years. That's what the model says. It is a year effect. It's not cohorts, it's not. And uh, we looked at this together with um, a retired chemist from um, Kripos, Tormod Bönnes, who helped us get some numbers. And our best guess as to what happened is that this was caused by a huge influx of benzodiazepines uh, from a big uh, illegal Russian factory around this period. There was a lot of uh, uh, benzodiazepine use around there, and that interacts. So if you use opioids, and you combine it with benzodiazepines and or alcohol, those combine to increase your overdose risk dramatically. So this was not, the decline is not because fewer people are using, it's not because we had a beginning op uh, program with um, LAR, as you can see here in the first years here, so few people in treatment that there's no way that could have caused that huge decline. Uh, and then finally, very last sentence, uh, remember, this is just the effects on death. That's all we looked at in the study, overdose deaths. But in addition, there are other good things that happened. And then we're left with the question, why did we have to wait all the way until 1997? I mean, the, the, here's where the people started discussing this. So here's where the Progress Party said we need to get this, and others, and the health minister. And then because of this drug-free ideology that we had, it just kept going until here, um, which shows that you know, even good intentions can sometimes backfire in, in um, sad ways. Thank you. <laughs>